amazing group of people called according to the purpose of God. He has anointed you for such a time as this. And to whom much is given, much is required. And part of the requirement that's upon your life is that you share who you know him to be and who he's made you to be. So, what I'm getting into this morning is not a new topic. It's what we've been talking about for the last five years or 44 years of New Life Church's history. Because for the history of the church, our motto has been the same, to know Jesus and to make him known. And the context of that is that every believer is a minister of the gospel. Where do we get that from? That's from Ephesians 4, 12 through 15. And we're going to be in that those scriptures today to talk about the simple truth of what we're called to be and called to do. And so we are not just followers of Christ. Yes, we're called to follow him. We're called to be like him. But we're also leaders of men and women into relationship with Christ. See what I mean? It's not just the first half. It's not just the following him yourself. Your life as you follow him, is creating a circumstance where people can see you and hear you and be led into relationship with Jesus. And you're going, wait, me? Yes, you are a minister of the gospel. And so in Ephesians 4.12, it says, for the equipping of the saints, and it's talking about, I'm starting right after it lists the fivefold ministry, which is apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, missing one, evangelists. Johnny's not going to let me forget evangelists. And so the fivefold is for the body, the gifts are for the body. The whole body working in unity and all of those that are listed are equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. You're the saints, the work of the ministry, sharing the gospel of Jesus with the world. All right? So you equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith. You listen to this list. Hold on. Give me a second. My... Touching my beard. Sorry about that. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Hear this list. This list is important. The unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So the equipping and the building are going to continue until we all attain. Until we all attain what? Unity of faith, knowledge of the Son, maturity, measure of the stature of Jesus, the fullness of Christ. So, yes, there is still some equipping (laughs) and building to be done. And that's really the first thing that we need to look at. Is we need to read that list and say, okay, how am I doing? Holy Spirit, how's it going? Have I attained this? Am I there yet? Now, I tell you that if you're seeking to attain the fullness of Christ, there's no finish line. Because the fullness of Christ is beyond infinite. It's just as much as you could ever receive in this life, there's still more to receive. But in this, we're continually seeking after him. We're drawing near to him.
I had a dream that really ministered to me this week, and I didn't think I was going to share it till right this second, but it was, it was one of those times where sometimes you can't tell if you're asleep or awake. It was that real. But I knew that I was in bed, and I knew that I was dreaming when I woke up from it, but the dream itself, I saw... I was having a conversation with God. Could I see the face of God? No. What I saw before me was the most beautiful fire I had ever seen. It didn't look like fire looks here. Fire here looks like a pale comparison of what the fire I saw looked like. It had colors in it that were beyond normal orange and red that you normally see in a campfire. And I could tell, I knew that the fire was God. And as I got near to the fire, I knew that there were things that had plagued me in my life that had no business near that fire, that were not going to be able to remain in proximity without being burned up. This is scriptural, but this is what I dreamed. And I could tell, I saw things that have bothered me since I was a child. And I knew them. It's like the closer I got to the light of the fire, the more it was revealed. By the Spirit, this is what takes place in our lives. The nearer you draw to God, the more that is revealed by the light of his presence. The more that is revealed by how he is and who he is. But the Holy Spirit is at work in us to conform us to the image of Jesus. And so, I'm standing before this beautiful representation of fire that I know is God. And I can tell that I have carried I'll tell you what it is I don't know if this is normal for people or not but this was my normal I feared lack from the time I was two years old that there wasn't going to be enough It's not something my mom and dad gave me. I didn't get it from them. They're sitting on the front row, but even if they weren't here, it wouldn't be their fault. It was something that was just there. Closer I got to that fire, the more I realized that that wasn't the word of God, and it wasn't true. And he was telling me things about my life that told me that I needed to get this issue fixed before I went further because it would cause trouble later. And I'm standing before him and I realize that it was it was obvious choice. It wasn't like that thing that was with me was beautiful or handy or useful. It was just a weight that I had carried needlessly. And I did the simplest thing. I threw it into the fire. Then I had a realization. Oh. Father. We're to be one. Why are you there and I'm here? And I jumped in. What is it to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice? 
That's it. I realized that nothing that I was hanging on to was as valuable as him. It wasn't as good, it wasn't as perfect, it wasn't as useful. And I jumped in. And when I jumped in, it wasn't like being burned up. It was like being received by love into his heart, into his presence, into who he is. And there was this, I understand now in a way I didn't understand before what glory feels like. I've prayed for glory, and I knew that I had a measure of glory, but in that moment, I could feel his glory, which is his manifested presence. And in his manifested presence, there was such a great peace that just consumed my being. Hey, I'll take that. And I realized that the, in that moment, staying in the middle of his flame is the most important thing that I could do with my life. To move as he moves, to speak as he speaks, to go where he goes, to do what he does, to be in the midst of his presence to have his abiding presence in my life, which has been promised and given, but has it been received by us? I desire it. I desire it more than I desired it before because now I've had a taste of it more than I've had in the past. I've been through revival. I've been in his presence. I've seen amazing things. I want to live in the midst. And he is a consuming fire. But in the midst of this consuming fire, you're like the burning bush. You're not destroyed You're just one with his presence. Is this deep and scary? No, it's really not. Because he said that he's going to work in us. He's going to work through us. He said that he's going to do these things in our lives. He's offered us these promises. He's told us who he is and what he would do. And he has made available to us this it's, you, it's like a feast. It's laid out before you all the time. And he said, you know, he told the children of Israel way back. He said, I set before you blessing and cursing. I set before you life and death. Choose life. It's the simplest thing in the world to say. But I ask, are we choosing life? Are we choosing to live in the fullness of what he has made available to us? Or have we allowed things that have no business exalted in his presence to remain? Those things need to be consumed by the fire. Because where we are going There is no longer grace for us to hold on to things that have been revealed by the Holy Spirit as needing to change. Because if you do not allow them to go, you're in disobedience. Once the truth has been revealed, then you're responsible for what you do with it. And are you going to repent and return? Are you going to let go and give it to him? Are you going to offer your life up to him as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable 
before God. Because that is our reasonable form of worship to him. Do you see that he's not asking more than he deserves? Because he is perfect and he is beautiful and he is wonderful and he is perfect love. In his kingdom will be manifested in this earth. And his church is not going to be defeated and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And in evil days, his church is going to shine like a beacon to the world. And do you know that you are the church that is shining? Which is why you have to be mature and in the fullness. Because for us to see these benchmarks in our lives, these things that he said, this unity that he gave us up, capacity to see, the maturity the fullness, the measure of stature, these things that you can look at your life and say, I have surrendered to Jesus and I am becoming like him. To see those benchmarks, you're going to have to own your emptiness. You know what that means? I am not able in my own ability. I am not righteous without him and I'm not holy without him but by his blood that was shed on the Calvary and by the cross I can stand as his representative on earth. But I have to boast about my weakness for his power to rest upon me. That means I have to own the fact that I'm empty and can't do anything without him. And in humility and teachability, receive the work of the Holy Spirit in my life to transform me into him. I have to admit that I have a great need of God. And I do. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Yeah. I need you to be you, God. I am not trying in my own ability to do anything. I've I've strived, I have fought, I have, my dad's quote, grab rooted and growled to try to get. And all of that is for naught in the kingdom. Because there's faithfulness and there's obedience. And if I do what he tells me to do, I will see increase. And if I humble myself, he will exalt me. And I don't have to chase exalting myself. And in fact, if I exalt myself and become proud, God himself will oppose me. I have no desire of being opposed by God. He is, he's going to be good at it. He's good at everything he does. He's perfect. If he's standing against you, that's, that's a Dusty Kemp quote. If God be for you, who can be against you? If God's against you, quit. <laughs> quit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He opposes the proud but gives grace and exalts the humble. (laughs) We need to let go of pretending that we have everything under control without him. It's not the truth. And we know it. We need 
to allow him to build us up and equip us individually and collectively for the future and the hope that he has for us, for this church, for this city, for our state, for our nation, for the world. It's that important. It's not just about how I feel. It's about who he is and what he is able to accomplish through yielded vessels. Because when his power dwells within you, all things are possible for those who believe. Mark me down as one who believes. I believe. Possibilities just opened up. Because he said they would. Because all things are possible to those who believe. Do you believe? Not just a believer. Not just God adjacent. Are you one with him? Is this the most important thing to you? Or is there a lot of important things? Because you're going to make time for what's important to you. And this is not a day to be messing around. Thinking that you have plenty of time to get things straight eventually. Eventually is now. Because you're hearing the truth this morning. And you're going to be responsible for what you know. So what does growth and maturity protect us from? Well, it says it in Ephesians 4.14. As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by trickery of people by craftiness and deceitful scheming. You know, that scripture is kind of scary. You know why? Because it has to be there. Because he included it in his word, which means that we are going to have to pay attention in the world that we live in so that we don't get caught up in the things that are happening around us so that as mature believers, we're not allowing. There is a serious, there is a lot of fire on what you allow and what you forbid in your life, in your family, in your house. I'm going to quote your wife. We were having a conversation and Dusty says, I just don't understand why people want to identify with death. Why are they, why are they putting death on their house? Why are they putting skulls on their house? Why are they putting skeletons everywhere? Why are are there spiders crawling on the outside of their house? They wouldn't want spiders crawling on the inside of their houses. It's a really simple question. Why would I want to identify with something I don't want to receive? But that's a really good question for the rest of Christianity because why do I want to identify with the curse that Jesus has delivered me from? Why do I want to identify with fear instead of love, joy, peace, and a sound mind? This is really basic. What is it that I want? What am I praying for? Am I praying for things that I'm actively acting against what I'm praying for? Is my life praying the same way as my words? Oh, uh uh-oh. God did that one. I didn't even, that's not in the notes. What is your life praying for? Not just your words. What are you praying for with what you do? Because how you sow is how you reap. 
So you may be praying for amazing things and doing things that bring sorrow and pain. I think we need to get our whole life on the same page. And that's oneness with God. That, that's being in agreement with what he has given us and who we are in him. And if we say that we are Christians, well, do we act like it? And so, as you grow in maturity, the result of this maturity and fullness is that you're not being tossed here and there by everything people say. Lord, if you are looking for an argument, you can find one. It doesn't even matter what you want to argue about. There is someone willing to argue with you about anything if you're looking for an argument, but the servant of the Lord is not argumentative. Huh. So that means if I want to act like him, I just preach the truth. The argument isn't, there's no reason. There's just saying the truth. So being tossed here and about by winds of doctrine, tricky people, and crafty, deceitful scheming. Yeah, there's some of those. There's people who will deceive you about the word of God. They'll tell you things that sound really too good to be true, and let me tell you, they are. If they tell you that your sin doesn't matter, they're lying to you. Don't believe it. Sin was costly enough to make Jesus perish on the cross and have to be resurrected. He was the sacrifice for that sin. That sin was very costly to him. And it still is. And he still hates it. Why does God hate it? Because it separates you from him. His desire is reconciliation. And so if you are actively practicing things that keep you away from the one who is able to save you and protect you and heal you and love you, then what you're saying isn't praying the same prayer as what you're doing. If you're practicing sin, why are you bothering with the rest of it? If you don't believe, it's like Paul said, if it's not true, there's nobody on earth that's wasted their time more than me. I'm paraphrasing Paul. But see, the, the thing is, it's true. <laughs> and so this life that you're living is a representation of what you believe, not just what you say, but what you do and what you say. What you say matters. How you say it matters. Who you say it to matters. When you say it matters. If you're led by the Spirit, then you're going to be saying the things at the right time, a word fitly spoken in due season. If you're going in your own ability and in your own timing, then there's a lot of damage that can be done, even with the truth, because the truth has to be in love. To be effective, truth and love go together. The loving kindness of God, the kindness of God brings men to repentance. So if we're not in the truth of who he is and what he said for us to be and walking in this place of maturity and humility and teachability, then we get off. We get out. We get out from under the covering. We get tossed about by things that people say and do because the Holy Spirit isn't testifying immediately to what is true and what isn't true because we're not mature and we're not allowing him to conform us into his image. So the more disobedient you become, the less truth you are able to receive. Does that make sense? In that place, 
What happens? Somebody comes along and they say something, you go, well, that might be true. Now, as a mature son or daughter in Christ, you hear that doctrine and the Holy Spirit says, yeah, that's true. Or you hear something and you go, and the Holy Spirit within you goes, no, 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 no. Livy in the back seat. If she hears music she doesn't like, it's no, 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 no. Okay, I want you to hear the Holy Spirit just like Livy. There's sometimes you're going to hear things. You're going to hear way more than you've heard so far. You're going to hear things. People are going to say things. People are going to preach things. You're going to hear doctrine. You're going to hear tricky stuff. (sighs) Deceitful scheming. And when you hear it, you're going to go, Holy Spirit, what's your vote on that? False. Yeah, I thought so. True or false? It is him or it isn't him. And as a mature son and daughter, you will be able to tell the difference. In Jesus' name, you will allow him, because of your humility and your teachability, to conform you into the image of Jesus so that you will know. As a result, you're not going to be like a child anymore in this. You're going to be a child in your faith, but you're not going to be a child like you're walking around getting pushed aside by every weird thing somebody says online. No, that's not you. Because if you allow that to happen, you're insulated and you're inoculated from things that aren't true by our living, growing relationship with Jesus Christ who lives within you. And by the spirit of truth, who is the Holy Spirit, who is within you. He gave you his spirit to lead and to guide you. I'm closing. But hear me. Because we're part of the family of God, we are also called to be part of the family business. I started the message with this. The family business that we're called to be a part of is the will of God being done on the earth as it is in heaven. What is the will of God? The ministry of reconciliation? The gospel being preached? Disciples being made? These are things that God desires. This is the marching orders of the church on the earth. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. What has he told you to do? This is really simple, but what keeps you out of error? It was actually Mario just dropped this at a dinner table one time a couple of weeks ago. He said things that keep you out of error are just integrity to the word, being a person of prayer, and love for souls. If you have these things, you're not going to get blown around by weird things that come. If you're in prayer, if you're praying without ceasing, then you're working on that relationship all the time. If you love the word of God, and every word that proceeds from his mouth is how we live. You need to love it. You need to be in it. You need to be reading it. You need to be feasting upon it. Allow God to speak to you through his word. The integrity of his word will keep you out of trouble. But see, we're called, Ephesians 4.15 says, to speak the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ. Because we're not just followers of Christ. We're called to lead people into Christ. And we have to be leaders that they can follow. Every one of us. 
And just because there are leaders who haven't been true to that doesn't mean that the responsibility isn't true for us. This is not the kind of situation where you want to be like Adam and Eve and you go, well, what about them? Or like where Peter points at John and says, what about his life? It does not matter. You can point to a hundred people who have fallen morally and it is not going to change that you are going to be responsible for how you conduct yourself as a minister of this gospel. What are you going to do with what you've been given? How are you going to act? What are you going to pray? I pray the heart of Jesus over us. That heart doesn't esteem its own life more than the people around it. It starts seeing things as they really are where the lives of these that we are surrounded by on a daily basis matter to God. And yes, he loves you with an everlasting love, but he also loves them and desires that they be reconciled to him. And these two things are not in competition. They need to be in unity. Because that's what maturity looks like. Maturity looks like realizing, and this is like all of you that are parents, the day comes where you realize, oh wait, I'm responsible for more than myself. And you start, there are days where you will forget whether you ate or not, but you're going to make sure that the baby did. How is it that we have been called according to this purpose? in the earth and we stay so wrapped up in our own personal things that we forget that his heart breaks for them that need to come to the knowledge of Jesus that are without hope in the world until they get that revelation of him. And so, if we aren't faithful to what we've been taught, we're like the blind leading the blind. That's what Jesus said in Luke 6, 39. Jesus told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? If you reject the truth and if you reject the place of maturity... You're not just a danger to yourself. Because especially if you call yourself a Christian, but you're rejecting the message of Christianity and the truth that it holds, what you're doing is you're leading people into a form of Christianity, but denying the power of it. God said to avoid people like that. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're like the blind leading the blind if you're not leading them closer to him, if you're not leading them into that place where he is, if you're not leading them into the transformation, if you're not leading them into wholeness and healing, if you're not leading them into purity and holiness. You're leading people into a pit. The next verse says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. That's Jesus. We're growing into the fullness and the stature of Jesus, who is the head. I'm not going to be above Jesus, but I'm going to be like Jesus. And when I'm like Jesus, then people can see Jesus. And hear Jesus. And they can feel the love of Jesus from my actions. They can hear the love of Jesus in my words. The truth is not hidden. The truth is revealed. And the truth is, that we are either gathering or scattering already.
If your life isn't in agreement with what you say you believe, you're scattering. You need to come into agreement. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again, and you believe that he can forgive you of all of your sins and trespasses, then you need to also believe that he is king of kings and lord of lords and offer your life to him as a living sacrifice and allow him to work within you. His plan and his purpose for your life is better than anything you could ever do in your own ability or imagine. His power that is available to manifest through you is beyond your comprehension. The doors that he can open are not doors that you would even be able to find in your own ability. He is that able. What would he like to teach you right now? What's his message to you? What's he saying to you individually? See, I've given you the big word. I've given you the truth. Father, I pray grace over the word that I've spoken to them today that by the power of the Holy Spirit, it would land in good soil and bear fruit in Jesus' name. I believe, Holy Spirit, that you are in this room right now to convict us. Because conviction is a gift. That we could turn towards you and be like you. To come to this place of fullness and maturity in you, Jesus. So that we're not tossed about by trickery and we're not deceived and we're not led astray, God. But we are completely and fully committed to a growing relationship with you. And that relationship will save us from immense sorrow and pain in this life. But it will save those around us from eternity without you, God. God, minister to our hearts. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Jesus, I acknowledge how you are because we are called to be like you, our teacher. And you are in the perfect will of God. You are humble, you're obedient, you're faithful, you're loving, you're patient, you're full of compassion, you're giving, and you're kind. And we desire to be like you, and we give you permission to be at work in us, to conform us and transform us to being like you. And some of you need, you need a line in the sand drawn between your old life and the life that starts today. You need Jesus. Some of you have known Jesus, but you've gotten away from him. The cares of the world and the encumbrance of sin has gotten you. Today you can be free and repent. His arms are open wide for you to return to him right now. Tell him. Ask him. Tell him what you repent of and ask him to forgive you. If you need to make Jesus Lord of your life, it's expressing what I said that a Christian believes. Jesus, I believe that you died for me on the cross. 
I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose again. Jesus, I believe that you're praying for me right now. Jesus, I ask you to wash me clean and make me new. Teach me how to live your way. Give me your Holy Spirit that I can, that I can do things that the way you want me to do them, that I can say the things you want me to say. God, I ask you now in Jesus' name that you would give each and every person who hears the sound of my voice an awareness of your glory, your manifested presence, that they would be a people that hungers and thirst for righteousness and that they would be satisfied, that they would desire your abiding presence and that as they draw near to you, you would draw near to them, God, so that they would come to know what it's like to walk in your perfect will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.